And I, I've, I've mentioned it a few times, but de Broglie was a, a PhD student during the quantum revolution of the early 1900s. And, um, which, I mean, it just would have been a fascinating experience that, I mean, not necessarily to be him, but to, say, be his friend or whatever, just kind of watch how this had, had unfolded. Um, because as I've refer referenced before, his insight into this is, is really what kind of led, you know, Bohr and Heisenberg and, and um, uh, uh, Einstein to ultimately the, the, the most correct version of quantum mechanics as we know it today. So, uh, and, and we'll start actually with um, the, so by the way, he, he was a little bit past Einstein's, um, he came a little bit be, uh, after Einstein had his um, uh, uh, special and general theory of relativity, I correct that, just the special theory of relativity, because the starting point for the de Broglie hypothesis is that we're going to try to apply the, the basic laws of rel, uh, relativistic energy, and we're going to apply those to not just photons, but to, um, well, we'll see how it goes. We're going to try to use the, the mathematics that describes photons relativistically, but then we're going to try to capture and talk about particles using all of this together. So I'm getting ahead of myself, but we'll see what happens here. Actually, I'm not going to say interpreted. I'm going to say applied. So I hope that makes sense. He, uh, we're going to apply these laws. Uh, we're going to treat uh, particles as if they're massless photons that have a wave-like nature. But then we're going to go back and say, hey, you're allowed to be a particle too at the same time. Um, so it, it's kind of a cool way to, to think about it here. So first of all, as we recall, or as we may be more likely have forgotten, uh, the relativistic energy at, that Einstein had derived from his theory, or and not so much derived, just he had just guessed, and, and it's right, uh, we think, uh, but the relativistic energy looks something like this. E squared equals, now this first term, as you recall, PC squared, or you can remove the squares, this essentially refers to the kinetic energy of, of a, I'm going to start using the, I've stopped using the word particle, and the kinetic energy of a thing, for the sake of anything else, plus this term here. And this, as you recall, refers to the rest energy of a, well, a massive thing, specifically. And, again, to be clear, in the case of um, a, a, a classical particle that's at rest. So an electron, a proton that's not moving, we can very safely set P or the, the momentum to zero. And this is exactly where the equation E equals MC squared comes from because the only type of energy that can have is strictly just due to its mass. And then on the flip side of it, if you remember for photons, this equation we believe also, or, or he believed also, did refer to photons equally well that have zero mass. And what we got out of that is that even if you have a photon with no mass, you can rearrange this equation and you can determine that a photon does indeed have a momentum even though there is no mass associated with it. And, you know, that's, that was our first hit. And, and I think, as I recall, when we went through this, you know, eight weeks ago or so, that I, I said, we're going to come back to this once we hit quantum. So here we are. So let's take exactly what I just said and let's roll with that now. So I'm going to get rid of this and uh, we're going to do that exact analysis a little more properly. And then we're going to say, okay, it actually applies to particles as well. By the way, I was so happy that I discovered this in my, in my office. I have an eraser now. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't have this for the entire semester. So uh, remember, by, by analyzing this, we can set M0 equal to zero and that will tell us that for a photon, the energy is, sim is simply just PC. Or we can rearrange this a little bit here, and we can solve it for P. The momentum of the photon is E over C. So going from this, the other thing that we had known at this point, and this is, cre uh, this is credit or, or due to the photoelectric effect, that... If you have a single photon, we know exactly how to calculate the energy of that now. Hey, Lenny, are you going to learn quantum mechanics, bud? Come here. I'm going to pause and get Lenny's bed so we can learn.
Okay, so again, by the photoelectric effect here, we determine that E, the energy of a photon, is also equal to H nu, or Planck's constant times the frequency of that photon. And so I'm just gonna substitute that now into this equation here. We now have the momentum of that photon, which again, I wanna be clear, this is a strange thing. This doesn't make sense classically. If you don't have mass, you don't have momentum. So everything we're doing is strictly a mathematical model versus you know, a model of reality as our heads conceive it. Um, all right, so we, we're gonna take this energy and we're gonna apply it to the relativistic momentum of the photon. So we now have P, the momentum, equaling H nu over C. We can simplify this further because if you remember, for any sort of a wave, the wavelength and the frequency are inversely related. And what I mean by that, for any wave, if you take the wavelength and multiply it by the frequency, that will always tell us the wave speed, which in this case I'll write as V, but when we, when we apply it specifically for photons, you know exactly what that speed should be. Um, now, and ju just a bit of an intuitive you know, interpretation of this again, because this we actually can reason out in our heads and it does make sense. Um, you can think of this as, uh, you know, there, there are, let's say a whole line of semis driving down, driving down the freeway and they're all packed bumper to bumper. So there's zero space between each semi. So think of the length of each semi as the wavelength and think of the frequency of the, of the wave as the number of those semis that pass you per second. So basically what we can do here is we can multiply how long each semi is by how many semis pass per second, and that will directly tell you how fast that entire train of vehicles is moving, which I think it's, it's a pretty good way of thinking about this. Um, hopefully you can kind, of, can kind of visualize that as I, as I describe it here, but it's the exact same thing with waves. How long each wave is, times how many of those lengths we will see per second will tell us how fast that whole pattern is moving forward. So I'm now just gonna change that to C because we are directly describing photons. And so we can therefore slightly rearrange it and we can say that C over nu is exactly the same thing as lambda or inversely, lambda over C is the inverse of a wavelength. How are we gonna apply that here now? It's pretty, uh, I, I think I might have said nu over c is the inverse of the wavelength. I think I, I said that wrong. We see that, that's exactly what we see there. So at this point here, I'm just gonna substitute nu over c for the inverse wavelength. So this now becomes simply just h over lambda. And now to be clear, Everything we have talked about here is describing photons. That photons we know, even before the photoelectric effect, we knew that photons were, no, I can't say that. Um, I take back everything I say, because th this relies on a slightly particle inter interpretation. But the point is that, that this is specific for, for describing photons using uh, essentially the laws of the relativistic energy of a photon. And so I want to be, I want to kind of highlight that here for, for photons, we can describe the momentum of the photon in terms of the energy, but more directly observable, we can just describe it in terms of the wavelength, which is the much easier thing to see. And then the other way that, that I kind of describe this here, or you can see it, is if you have some photon, which again, the, the way to kind of symbolize photon in, in, uh, properly is just the Greek letter gamma, lowercase, you can describe that photon as moving forward with a given wavelength at a velocity of c. Now, one th a trap that's really easy to get into here is to physically think that photons move up and down. So for example, if this is a photon here, uh, let me use red. If uh, this is a photon here, you, the, the 
This is a photon. Uh, you, you can. It's easy to think physically that photon moves up and down as it moves forwards. And that's not what we have ever implied. Specifically, what we mean is that the phase of the photon has a wavelength. And, it, you know, so if you were actually able to directly identify that photon and watch it as it moved, it won't be going like this as it moves through space. It will be, it, it, what, what will happen though? Because we understand now that, that the photon is nothing but just waves of the electric and the magnetic field. And if you can directly observe the electric field, what you would see is that the electric field will have maxima and it will have minima. A maxima, minima, maxima, minima, maxima, minima. And the distance between those maxima and minima of that electric field and, and also of the magnetic field, the separation between those maxima and minima are exactly what the wavelength of that is. So, so kind of get it out of your head because this will be really important in a moment. Get it out of your head that the photon is physically making a wave. It's strictly just that the phase that describes the electric field and the phase that, there's, that describes the magnetic field changes with a spatial periodicity of lambda. Those are big words, but those are correct words, and that's why I'm using them. So let's move on with that a little bit. Let's apply that now to particles. I'll, I'll pause while I erase here. <laughs> 